say a big thank you to our friends at Subway, uh, the Subway on Mount Rushmore. Uh, they were having a little bit of an issue this morning and forgot to make the food and to their credit got it together and got it here very quickly. So thank you to our friends at Subway. Good job. Uh, we're kind of living on borrowed time, aren't we? I haven't seen any snow yet. You know, I'm new to this area and this has just seemed great to me and everybody keeps laughing at me. So I'm going to keep living on this borrowed time and keep soaking it up. I know Coach Tink is enjoying the weather right now and hopes it continues like this for certain. So, hey, what we have ahead here, uh, cross country just had the uh, Rocky Mountain Athletic Conference meet last weekend in Chadron, and they are looking forward to, not this upcoming weekend, but the following weekend, they'll be down in Canyon, Texas at the South Central Region meet. Uh, men's soccer this weekend, uh, they are at home Friday. They're at home at two o'clock in the afternoon against Fort Lewis College. And on Sunday, they play Adams State at 11 a.m. Volleyball is also home uh, this weekend. Friday, they play Metro State at 7 o'clock p.m. Saturday, they play UCCS at 5 o'clock. And as we all know, football has a home game, or I'm sorry, on the road this Saturday. They're at Fort Lewis College at noon, and then they're home the week after that. So looking forward to some good stuff this weekend. Get out to some hard rocker events this weekend, please. Uh, the first coach. Cross country, Steve Johnson, please come up and tell us about how the uh, championships went the last weekend. All right, thanks, Kevin. And uh, first, I want to thank the uh, Hard Rock Club for uh, putting on the uh, bagels and coffee on this Saturday morning. That was, uh, that was great. We got to see a few, few new faces and uh, got, to, uh, got to get a chance to see a little bit more on cross country. Um, well, I can tell you first off, I could tell we were not at Dunham Field right away because it was not 75 and sunny. <laughs> but uh, a little bit breezy out. Um, by the time the men raced, the wind was gusting up to about 30, I think it was 36 miles an hour was the highest that I saw. Um, and uh, I've got a couple ladies here who are going to come up later. And they can tell you that the number one thing that cross country runners hate is wind. But, uh, we got in there, we, we raced really hard, and uh, we had a, had a pretty good day. Men, men finished 12th, uh, pretty much right on par with what we were expecting. They were actually a lot closer to that 11th spot than we expected, so that was a, a really nice surprise for us. Uh, had a new leader on the men's side this time. It was Andy Ferris, uh, and Andy's a uh, guy from Ohio that I've mentioned a couple times, and uh, Andy really got in. He, controlled himself a little bit this time. He was uh, fifth through the first K at uh, Fort Hayes State and uh, then fell off quite a bit after that. And uh, he made sure not to be fifth this time at the first K. So um, that, that definitely paid off for him as he, he went through. And then we had a, a really strong pack. Our, our number five, if you recall, Fort Hayes had fallen off just a little bit. We had two minutes between our fourth and our fifth this last time. We had less than two minutes between our first and our fifth on Saturday. So a huge, huge improvement there. Probably the, the thing that stood out to me the most on the men's side was uh, how many of our guys we got to run this course back in September. The conditions were pretty nice uh, weather-wise. And uh, we actually had almost every single one of our men take, uh, take time off of what they ran back in September. We had uh, several of them took at least a minute off, and uh, our number, our new number six guy, I should say, Brandon Wiganowski, took two minutes off the time he ran there in September. So 
So I had some really good performances out of the men's race. Uh, on the women's side, we found, we found ourselves in 10th place. Uh, good news on both sides was uh, even though 10th ties what we finished last year, uh, the good news is that uh, both of our teams set new best or low points for most points we scored at an Ironman championship. Uh, and on the men's side, I forgot to mention, Andy is actually the highest finisher we've ever had on the men's side in an Ironman championship as well. So, uh, but going back to the, the ladies, uh, I'll tell you what, they blew me away uh, with the way that they ran. They, they uh, really, really embraced the Ironman championship for what it is. And there's a, there's a hill, a downhill on the course. Uh, on the 5K version, it's about uh, 800 meters out from the finish or so. On the uh, 6K version, obviously, uh, that stretches out a little bit further, but uh, the downhill's about like this. Is that about it, right, ladies? Yeah. And uh, they kind of they were on cruise control coming down it when we ran it back on, in 5K uh, back in September. And the way they came ripping down that hill on Saturday, I, I swear every single one of them passed at least five people coming down that hill. And uh, that's exactly what you have to do in the Army, because you have to take every every chance you can get to make a pass. Uh, I'll let the ladies talk a little bit about their races uh, when they come up here, but uh, we saw uh, Adeline in the Stratmire, who's going to be one of the ones coming up here. Addie finished. 25th overall, which got her second team all our back for the second year in a row. Uh, and uh, she was closely followed by Erica Westerman, who was 37. Uh, second team all our back goes up to 28th, so um, I believe she was within about uh, 20 seconds of being second team all our back. Uh, so pretty pretty good improvement for her because she was in the 90s national <coughs> place wise. Uh, and then our number three, uh, was Carrie Racky, who's also going to come up here in just a minute. Carrie was uh, what, 56th overall, I believe, and uh, that actually worked out. They allow us to run two extra runners at the RMAC, uh, two more than, than have anything to do with scoring. And so there were a few from, from uh, a couple of those other teams that, that were up ahead of her, but she wound up 50th, or 50th, I believe, overall in scoring places. Which, which actually uh, basically equaled what she did last year, which was exactly what we were looking for with with her this weekend. So saw some really, really good performances, and uh, I'm going to let the ladies take it away. <coughs> Thank you. 
That's kind of scary. <laughs>
that's one of my personal uh, areas I've realized like in coaching I'm kind of neglecting and however we we're playing some really good soccer and maybe uh, non soccer fans might not see that but there's 60 70 minutes of these games against Pueblo especially like and we played really really well and you know, I hear a lot of the coaches talk about stats and use numbers to quantify things and I I don't think that way but I looked some up this past week and this weekend we lost to Pueblo on Friday four to two all four of their goals coming from set pieces and they outshot us 12 to 11 right like, so in terms of where we're creating our chances how we're scoring like we are having some really quality accommodations I mean even in that it was three to two with 90 seconds left and we ended up giving up a penalty that late and just like uh, we had a missed kick out of the back, and maybe if that's a, a little bit better. I mean, we had the pressure on Pueblo that whole second half. Uh, up until that point, it really looked like we were going to tie. We even had a shot off the crossbar. Uh, so it's we we kind of closed the weekend on a note where we talked about how we don't want to find silver linings and losses anymore. Like we're we're really too good for that, and that's something like I'm a very positive individual. I and it's easy for me to see like, oh man. 60 minutes, 70 minutes, we're playing so well. You guys are doing a lot of the right things, and I'm tossing a lot at you. Like, I'm tossing stuff that we should be working on over three years and two weeks. And the guys have really stepped up to it, and we're doing well. And the two guys that, that are gonna come up and talk today um, are two of many on this team that it's easy when you're going on a losing streak to lose hope as a coaching staff, as a player. Of, you know, I've been on losing teams before, and it's tough to stay motivated and keep doing the right things. Uh, these guys' attitudes and the things they're bringing to the table in training and in games have kept me into. Like, I want to keep watching film. I want to keep looking for new ways. And even yesterday, I'm like, oh, we'll do this differently. We can do this differently. And it's because of the work these guys are putting in, the quality they're showing. Uh, they're they're giving me hope each week. So, let's. Uh, Brad, can you queue up the clips against Pueblo, please? <coughs> have four clips here. This is our goal. This ties the game. A really good counterattack. I think from some of my luncheons this year, talking with you guys, I talk about I want us to attack at pace. I want us to catch teams out. And we did this year. Yeah, that's a that's a really quality team goal. Versus, I, I should have showed the clip, but their first goal is just a sloppy kind of error on our part, where we're, we're actually exhibiting a little bit of quality. Here again, a similar counterattack situation. You see, uh, this guy has a really good run to get onto the ball here. That's not easy to do. Nice combination. So this is a little bit of a drawn out clip, but these are the areas we want to get into. This is how we want to progress the ball. They have a clearance here, and we and we almost get onto the end of this. It's a really nice ball in from Cam. It just goes right across the face goal. We really expect somebody to be crashing that. That should be a tap in for somebody, so really close here. This is our second goal against Pueblo. And so this is a goal for us off of set piece, set piece, which is really rare. And you don't often see us having five, six players crashing the ball. I think we, we tend to spectate on some of those situations, so that's a great effort from five of our guys making it tough on that. <coughs> and here is a play in the second half. Again, you'll see Cam Thompson here. He's really coming to his own. This, he's a junior, and this weekend of games was the best I've ever seen him play. Uh, really good from him. This is another junior, Noah, with a shot. You can't see it, hits off the crossbar and just uh, stays out of the goal. I, I mean, that was one that would have tied the game. Right, so I didn't want to berate you guys with clips, so I was really, really encouraged from our play there. On Sunday, we lost to UCCS 3-0. I was looking at some of the stats. Last year, we played UCCS twice, losing both games. In those two games combined, we had 12 shots. In our one game this year against UCCS, we had 12 shots. And that's what I want to see. Like, I want to create chances. I want, if you guys come out to Stu Park and watch us, I hope you're entertained. I don't want you to see us playing survival soccer because that's not what I believe in. Um, again, some of the, sorry. Again, I'm not a numbers guy, so I did have to write these down. Um, last season, we had 16 goals in 17 games. Through 15 games this year, we have 18 goals. Already a, a new program record for goals scored. We have three games remaining. We already have four more shots than we did all of last year with three games remaining. We have 13 more corner kicks than last year, and we're on pace to have the best game of the season. So in terms of numbers, which I don't like, because I think they, sometimes they're askew, but we're doing a really good job. Uh, always want more, though. 
Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, two freshmen. You guys can start walking up. I'm, I'm going to talk about you for a second. Uh, here in the, uh, the Peach is Julian Bouchard. He's been playing left back. I've mentioned him before. Uh, I'll let him talk about himself some, but as a freshman, he's come in and done great for us. And uh, let me remind you, Julian is the one who I was playing out of position. He kept telling me he's a left back. And, uh, he has absolutely been stellar there. We talk about players winning individual matchups and the position he plays, he's often matched up against the best attacking players on other teams. I don't think he's lost a single individual battle against. I mean, the first time he played at his position was against Colorado Mines, who's top in the conference. Uh, nothing came up his side. Uh, really good from Julian all year. Uh, this is Logan Jurgens. Uh, Logan's been redshirting this year. And even early on, Logan's a guy who we we could have played and got minutes, but he's somebody, my vision for him was, I want you for four years at 90 minutes a game. I knew that this year coming as a freshman, what are you, nine months from an ACL? Just nine months back, he's already been killing it in training. And actually this weekend, uh, Julie and I were talking right before the game and just, uh, about training, how the season's been going. And <laughs> Julie looks at me, he's like, coach, Logan's gonna be nasty. <laughs> he's like, that's, that's how the team feels. Even like alumni, um, well, they're not quite alums yet, but we have some guys who have exhausted their eligibility that are still on campus. They've come out and watched some training sessions. They're like, Coach, Logan's really good. I was like, let's, let's not give him too many ideas, but he really, really is. And he's someone you haven't seen on the field this year that we are so excited about. Um, so I'll let these two talk a little bit. Um, if you have questions, uh, please feel free to ask. All right, so like you said, my name is Logan Jurgens. I'm a freshman mechanical engineer. I'm Julie Bouchard, and I'm a freshman uh, we're, I'm coming in as a red shirt. I tore ACL, LCL, and meniscus nine months ago. So it's been an injury prone year, but coming back from that, looking forward to some minutes next year, getting back on the field. I played five games in the last year. So definitely looking forward to some games. Yeah, and I can't wait for next year, too, so I'll play the full season of left back. <laughs> I wanted to ask you guys uh, why you chose Estes Mines. Can you both share where you're from? Yeah, I'm from Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, so Colorado Mines is the more, wow. <laughs> <laughs> more local school for me. Um, but you know, I went, um, reached out to Conniff, met with him in Denver, really liked his visions for the team, what he was talking. Uh, came up here for a camp, enjoyed the camp, enjoyed the guys that I was playing with, came back for a visit, stayed with two of the older players, enjoyed my time here, thought, found myself fitting in with the team. And so yeah, I got home and about a week later I committed. So yeah, I was just came here, felt that it was the right spot for me, enjoyed my time, the academic opportunity was what I was looking for. Athlete, so I was definitely looking for a good academic school first. So I was just fit in my criteria of what I was looking for in school and also the ability to continue my athletic career. So. Uh, so for me, I was looking more into like law school because my parents said I, I argued too much and said I should be a lawyer. <laughs> so um, late junior year, um, Coach Khan came out to a showcase in uh, Colorado and watched me play and sent me an email. But uh, the email actually got caught up in my spam. And so several months later, it's early in the senior year, there's another freshman on the team named uh, Trent McGreta, also from Kelly, Texas, and went to the same high school. And he tells me, like, hey, I just committed to this school in Armagh, they're called South Dakota School of Mines. And right around then, I was like, I think I kind of want to do engineering. So Trent tells me about this, and I was like, you know what? I think I remember hearing about them or like emailing them before a showcase or something. And so I go through and I check my like spam from like that like week, and I'm like, oh gosh, they emailed. <laughs> so I email Coach back and I'm like, hey, um, your email is in my spam. Are you still interested? And they were like, yeah, why don't you come up for a visit? So I came up on my visit. It was like the first day of snow here or something like that. So it was freezing cold from Texas. It was awful. <laughs> um, so we talked to Coach. Uh, he gives me an offer and I'm like, okay, give me like a week or two to think. And then the next day I just committed. What are your majors? Uh, we're both mechanical engineers. Any other questions? Right, let's give a little soccer vocab. So what's uh, Julian, why don't you describe uh, what saucing someone is? Okay, so um, saucing someone can be uh, 
humiliating them in almost any way, basically. Um, that's honestly sounds awful, but one of my favorite things about the game is just making the other team look really bad by doing something cool to them. Your teammates get hyped, even sometimes hearing the other team's bench laugh at their own player is just like, it's like makes my day. It's also something that's just like, just beating them really bad. Uh, uh, Julian's a very good dribbler, that's something he does a lot, and Logan, what about a ping? Like, what about a ping? That's, you get the ball, and then the ping just like it lays your pass, or you find someone on the other side of the field. Well, it could be called a long ball, um, but a ping is just pinpoint accuracy, straight into the feet, straight into someone's run. Straight in the upper 90. Straight in the upper 90, you can have a ping shot, so that's just a well-placed, Ball, any sort of long ball shot, something like that. So, what do you guys do for endurance and stamina? How do you train? Do you run a lot? Do you? Um, so, in the summer, we did a lot of like preseason conditioning on an individual level. Um, and then during <coughs> practices, we did a lot of our conditioning from actually just playing. Just playing soccer and running around and being in the right spots. You get a lot of not, it's not just like straight endurance. We don't just line up on the line and do sprints until we can't run anymore. We get into game situations and, you know, moving around as a team, finding the gaps on the field. Soccer's a game that doesn't stop much, so you always have to move to find the right spot. So it's more game-like situations and practices. We go 11 to 11 a lot of practice. We go small side at 77, so that's a quicker, so it's more dynamic runs instead of elongated, short runs, or so yeah, just game-like situations. I guess that's kind of what I'm trying to say. Uh, so in summer we were supposed to do uh, a lot of running. Uh, <laughs> I don't really know. You know, I'm not just. Don't quote me on this. I may or may not have followed up too strictly. I mean, coaches see me on the field dying, just like trying to get back. I'm stumbling. It's like late in the game. It's just like run, Julian, run. <laughs> um, sometimes during practice, you know, we have a little bit of a motivation to make us run harder during this game. Like at mini games, such as uh, you know, a loser has to do volunteer work, or a loser has to like rep volleyball games or something. So everyone just like goes hard so that we don't have to do that on our weekend. So coach said you, you can play well right now for about 60 minutes. A little bit about that. How are you guys going to get to the 90 minute level? What do you need to do? Uh, I think it, a lot of it comes in individual work. Um, going in the summer, we really put the board by yourself. We do what we can as a team, but we don't want to spend practice just running, but like getting to play with our teammates and find that, that confidence in our teammates and what our teammates like to see. So I think the biggest, the next step kind of is putting in the individual work in the summer off season, you know, we're back for breaks, so we're going out and doing some individual training, some running. Um, so just I think the next step is going to be individual work. We put in work as a team, but we have to see the individual work to get to that next level. So uh, for me, I was like this close to redshirting at the beginning of the year, but uh, with some of the faith from my teammates and from our coaches, uh, I got lucky enough to go to the first travel team and also with a groin injury, so I'm gonna, you know, I got in my second. So um, I started off in the season playing a position I wasn't like, not like unfamiliar with, but not comfortable with necessarily. And so I was playing around 40, 45, 60 minutes a game. And uh, just like the last like four or five games, we started playing outside back and some more like 80, 90 minutes a game. Uh, against Mesa, I got so tired in the first half, I had to ask for a sub and Coach was like, okay, we got you. It was like 10 minutes later, I get myself, I'm dying. I'm like, Coach, thanks, but like, what good that happened earlier? <laughs> We're asking you questions, you have to ask me. Any more questions? Yeah. Does elevation affect your play when you go to Colorado? Or maybe your are I'm from Colorado, so I'm used to it. This is lower elevation, so I felt pretty good coming in the preseason and trained. Four columns, which is about 5,000 feet. Um, so that doesn't affect me, but from Texas. So, I mean, as you all know, I followed that fitness very strictly at the beginning of the 
summer. So the first tournament we went to was in Mesa. It's like 7,000 feet. I'm coming from 500, and it was absolutely terrible. I was like ready for season to end right then and there. <laughs> but I mean, the same thing kind of happens when Colorado teams used to come to Texas in the summer and be like 100 degrees and 90 percent humidity. They just it was fun second halves. Three, three matches left. What are your thoughts in the last three matches? You see the way you want. Yeah, I got this one. Okay. Um, the four blues I'm really looking forward to because I've got some uh, a buddy from Texas that's playing for the team, and uh, I think that <coughs> despite our recent results, our performances have been getting stronger and stronger. And honestly, I think that we can get wins in these next three games. And I'm trying to, we are trying to make the, the tournament by being in the top six for the arm I think all three of the games are winnable. Uh, just like you said, shot count-wise, I think it's obvious that our next step is we can start finishing those shots. If we start putting goals and we have better results, that's one thing the team in general has struggled with, and it's all in history. So I think that's kind of the next step defensively. You know, the best goals against the record. Um, but I think our next step is just put those opportunities away and we'll start seeing those other people. Any more questions? Gentlemen, thank you. Very good. Next up, volleyball, head coach Jenny Mulduke. Gunnison and Grand Junction this weekend, and I, for one, was definitely glad that we have not seen snow yet, because driving over the passes and through those canyons with snow on the ground was, would not have been enjoyable basketball. I don't envy you guys at all having to travel during the winter. Um, something they Andrew said, you know, like, a lot of coaches are really stats-based, and they made me think of a story. When I first started out coaching, I was, first I first started out coaching, I was extremely emotional, completely irrational, and pretty much terrible to be around. I felt very bad for anyone who played for me in my first head coaching job. And uh, I didn't care about stats. I cared about how I felt and what things looked like and uh, kind of get in my way a little bit. Uh, then I realized pretty quickly that I wasn't ready to be a head coach because of those things. And I was working for Colorado State and mostly just doing statistical stuff. And again, like, I didn't like it. It's pretty boring, kind of dry, not the fun part of sports. And uh, my head coach at the time, Tom Hilbert, who's a really successful coach at Colorado State, who won a lot of championships um, Mountain West, and he's had a lot of success as a head coach, uh, pulls me into his office, tells me that I'm a liar, <clears throat> makes me watch every touch of this match over and over again, makes me cut every clip of it out over and over again, uh, because he does not believe the numbers that are showing up that I gave him. Uh, and at that moment, I made me realize that wow, our perceptions are pretty heavily influenced by a lot of things. Uh, how we felt in that moment, how we feel about that particular athlete, uh, and maybe we really need this stuff to make sure that we've got kind of objective opinion. And that's nothing against you, obviously. I just, like, it really changed the way that I looked at the game in that moment, realizing that, like, we got to have some uh, objective information to go with our perceptions. Uh, this weekend, we, we had some issues uh, we had some illness on the team, and, and our athletes were grinding through it. I realized after going back and watching the film that we, we had to make a decision between like, hey, this player's really good, she's not feeling great, but she's our best player in that position, and maybe her 70% is still better than everyone else uh, that we have. And we went with that and, and realized that we, we made some sacrifices in communication with someone who doesn't have a voice on the court, can't really talk to her teammates very much. Um, and so, in retrospect, obviously, I think maybe we would have done a couple things a little bit differently, but we learned some stuff about who we are and uh, what causes those kind of issues in our team. Uh, even though we, we did some good work against Mesa, uh, Justine, who's been sharing time on the right side, came in at 300. Uh, Mac, uh, grinding through some illness, hit 273. Lily Lundquist, our little fresh in the middle, hit 429. Uh, this may have been the first time in season that we've struggled more defensively than offensively, and a lot of that was because of those communication problems we were having 
Uh, we only dug 52% of the balls, which is just not good enough. So it's a little bit easier to hit for a high number when you don't take as many swings. Um, someone I do want to give a lot of credit to is uh, our junior transfer, Ali Wagner. Uh, yeah, you can just start that. <coughs> so Ali Wagner's our libero, which is the kid who's wearing the wrong jersey on the court. Um, and we're on the other side right now. So Ali's a transfer. So she's a junior. She came in with a lot of experience. Um, and she's, she's just kind of a workhorse. And her response to a lot of things this season has been like, I'll just do it harder and I'll work harder and I'll like, just push, 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 push. And I don't know, probably when you're a lineman, that's a really good response. But when you're a libero, you've got to have some finesse and working harder at some things like isn't really the answer. And so we've been working a lot with her about doing a little bit less, um, doing things with a little more touch on the ball instead of just trying to power through some things. And that's, it's really hard when you've been doing something for, I mean, she's 20, 21, she's been doing this for 10, 12 years, this certain way that she's been taught. And the way that she, most people are taught to pass uh, is to work really hard, get your feet behind the ball, get the ball on your center line. And when you're you know, 10, 15, you're looking at balls that are coming in going 15 to 25 miles an hour. When you get into college, these balls are coming 35 to 45 miles an hour, and it's like a knuckleball in baseball. So the float serve that we're looking at moves pretty erratically and like can make these last second jumps. And uh, if you're moving, moving, moving back, these balls blow kids up like they're getting in the face and dropping out on them. So we've been working with her on changing a little bit of passing. Uh, going into this weekend, she was passing a 189, which is on a scale of one to three, that's her average. That's not great for uh, Against Western, she passed a 2.36, uh, Western 2.25, and Mesa was a really, really strong serving team, a 2.09. Uh, so I, I think she's mentally bought into this new process, but it takes a long time to break that uh, muscle memory. Uh, she's also leading the team in digs with 2.74 in the season, and is fourth on our team in assists. We treat our libero as our second setter, so if our setter digs that first ball, she chucks it over to her, and she's got to throw that ball off, so we got to be able to hit it, which is something we've not been great at. Um, at the beginning of our season, but we've been working a lot on that and improved quite a bit. She's fishing the ball pretty well now. Uh, like Kevin said, we're at home this weekend, 7 p.m. on Friday and 5 on Saturday. It'd be great to see you guys out there. Any questions? What coach do you think that you were with over the years? What coach has influenced you the most that you become a head coach? Yeah, that's, I'd say that's really hard to pinpoint which one has influenced me the most because I feel like everyone I've been with has been really, really strong at something completely different, which has been awesome. Like, Hilbert's great at program management. You go to a game there, there's 6,000 people in the stands, people are super involved and invested and like, want to be a part of it. Hamley is really good at team culture. Um, McCutcheon's really good at a lot of things. Really good technically, really good at getting people together and follow in a direction. So it'd be really tough. I think it'd be one of those things where, hey, if I could take like all of these things from all these different people and put them together, that'd be really cool. And then obviously, some coaches you're around, and I'm sure Chelsea feels this way about me. Like you look at things and you're like, yeah, that's not how I want to do things for whatever reason because it doesn't fit with my philosophies or I don't think it works the way that it's supposed to work. Just have a different perception of that. The teams this weekend are really good. Um, Metro just beat CCU in five. Thumped pretty good in the fifth set. Uh, they're pretty physical. They serve the ball really well. Um, Coach Carter would have a better perception on UCCS. I haven't got around to watching them quite yet. She's watching them right now. But they're strong. They're really strong teams in there. That would be a good challenge for us. Questions? Uh, didn't play our best football. I, I think what we were trying to do 
uh, kind of the same thing we were trying to do the week before with that win situation at the start of the game. You know, we really wanted to win the coin toss and take the breeze in the, in the first quarter. And the, the week before, Colorado Mines won the toss and, and went out to a big lead on us in the first uh, quarter. And then we went out and called heads, and we should have called tails on Saturday. <laughs> and, uh, and we ended up, you know, uh, being against the win in that first quarter and fell behind 15-0. And, you know, we didn't do a good enough job uh, offensively taking advantage of these four turnovers we earned on defense. I thought when you look at the overall game and you watch it like I do all the way through, you see that both defenses play good football on Saturday. Um, the difference was uh, we played the best third down defense we played in a long time except for the three plays that, that ended up in the end zone. Uh, one big one at the start of the game, one big one in the, in the third quarter, uh, and then one at the end of that first half. Otherwise, I thought it was one of the better defensive performances we've had, uh, as evidenced by, by, by the work that our guys did on the defensive side of the ball. Um, really, really strong effort. But we got four turnovers in the game. We only turned those four turnovers into seven points. And typically, that's something we've been pretty good at, is taking the momentum of what the defense is doing and translating it into what we do offensively. And we didn't do that on Saturday. Give credit to Chatham State. Um, for doing a better job than we did in those situations. But when I look back at the game, you know, we also now are in a situation where we've won three RMAC games and lost four RMAC games. Uh, the three RMAC games we've won, we've turned it over a combined zero times offensively, okay? And, and that helped us win three football games. The four games we've lost, uh, we've turned it over 13 times. So when you, when you really look at it, the game is pretty simple. Uh, and those, that simple fundamental is something that we were not doing a good enough job of on Saturday. And I think it cost us a golden opportunity because uh, we certainly went into that game feeling like we had the opportunity to go win a pretty, pretty big game on the road, uh, which is always a challenge in the RMAC, as you see uh, every single week in the RMAC, the teams that are on the road are having a hard time. Um, and, but we had a great opportunity at one on Saturday that we let go. Uh, we did have some great highlights from the game. I'm sure Brad has some of those up to share with everybody. That's us just running. It's like the cross country beat right there. Uh, big play. This is that first turnover, and I just mentioned it. You know, it's a tremendous play to get the ball out. We did it four times. You can see it's great juice by the defense. But then on that series, we came out and executed two plays extremely poorly to start that next series and didn't capitalize on that huge turnover. Here's Blake Stone's interception. It's really uh, created by Michael Redland tipping the ball up into the air on the screen. And then Blake gets the interception. Now right from there, we go down and score immediately, turn the game into a one possession game. So we did a great job taking advantage in that specific situation. And here's the play that got us down there. This is Jake Sullivan, kind of fools everybody, he throws it back to Dorian Coward. Uh, Dorian just played his butt off on Saturday, uh, really played hard. Um, and did a great job. Uh, but that got us down there, and we were able on this next play to punch it in with Dorian again, just get behind his pads. And uh, that, that, that one yard line, man, I'm, I'm telling you, uh, it, it keeps you up at night uh, the way we've played from the one yard line today, and it's just not been good football. NS Cepha got us within now a touchdown. This makes it 15 10. Uh, Ennis has been perfect on field goals since he took over the starting kicking job. Uh, so we're getting into Wally Pitt territory right now with Ennis. He's done an outstanding job. This play by Tristan Brown uh, takes the ball right out of the receiver's hands, forces a fumble, and then picks it up. I mean, you just don't see plays like that very often. That's just an outstanding individual effort by Tristan. Um, tremendous amount of toughness. And then showing the energy to say, that's our ball, bro. And yes, it is. That was a huge play. Huge play to keep him out of the end zone. There was about two minutes to go in the first half. Uh, big run right here by Jake on a third down play. You know, Jake's been one of the – he's the, one of the premier players in the league running the football. I mean, uh, good execution of a simple play there. Got us a big first down. Uh, and then this sack by Brian Acuna. Brian has really been challenged this season. He's a sophomore out of Houston area, and he just came up huge on Saturday. His best game is a hard rocker. Here's Jake to Dorian again. Uh, great move right there, wasn't it? And then look at this fight trying to get into the end zone right here. Just taking four guys with him. Again, 21 really played his heart out on Saturday. And then I think we do punch it in on this next one. This will be Brandon Labrie, our freshman. Brandon's a really good player. He's had a great freshman season. And he punches it in from the one-yard line there. And, and that got it to 22-17 with about three and a half minutes to go in the third quarter. And really, I think we all thought we might have had it at that point. But then the score happened on the next possession, the long pass. 
uh, that hurt us. Here's Jake getting out on a long run. You know, I really thought still with six minutes to go, I, I really thought we were still going to win the game, you know, and, and this play made me feel it uh, just as much as any, and, and so did this one. I thought we got the ball to Jermaine. He makes a nice catch. We're now down at the 21-yard line. There's four and a half minutes left. I figured we'd score. We were playing so well defensively. We still had three timeouts left. I figured we were going to score. We were going to stop them, and then we were going to get the ball back and go score again. That's what uh, we anticipated was going to happen, but it didn't. Uh, we just did not get the job done there. Uh, we played so well defensively. Blake Stone was named the Rocky Mountain Athletic Conference Defensive Player of the Week. Just a testament to Blake's work ethic. Uh, and then he just he was just fantastic on Saturday. Uh, I don't know how many tackles he had. It was, it was a, a bunch. He had the interception. Uh, but it's the first time we've had a defensive player recognized by the Rocky Mountain Athletic Conference. I think it's a testament uh, to what Coach Bryceman and the defense have done uh, and where we are as a program right now that that's improved. You know, where we are now is, you know, we got uh, the other players of the game. I apologize. The other players of the game are special teams player of the game was Brett Rankin, uh, number 83. Try to find 83 running down on kickoffs. All right. Uh, that's entertainment value in and of itself. Okay, You can make a YouTube video out of that. The pickaxe player of the game, you saw it as a pickaxe play, Tristan Brown. He got the, uh, the tackle, the strip, and the recovery on one play. High octane player of the game was Dorian Coer. Uh, tremendous effort from Dorian in some tough conditions. Uh, the defensive player of the week was Blake Stone, as you just saw. The energy player of the week was J.J. Banks, number 99. He's just a worldly dervish in there. He's an undersized defensive lineman. Um, undersized physically, oversized in, in the chest of, uh, where it matters, and he played uh, his heart out on Saturday. Uh, and that will give us the energy we need going into this Fort Lewis game. You know, Fort Lewis is outstanding at home. They, uh, they, they got after Colorado Pueblo very bad uh, two weeks ago in, in uh, Durango. Beat them bad. Uh, wasn't even really that close of a game. Uh, beat them by a couple of scores. And then they turned around and lost this past weekend to a team that uh, that they really felt like they should have uh, should have beat. Uh, Fort Lewis is going to be down. It looks like their starting quarterback is out, which is is kind of one of those deals where um, it's a little too bad because we don't really have film on the other kid playing quarterback, so we know he's a good player, but we really don't see him much. So we'll probably see a little bit different than what we've seen, but we need to go stop the run, obviously protect the football on Saturday, and give ourselves a chance to win. It's hard to win on the road in the RMAC. We got two chances left. And we got to go get one on Saturday. Uh, I can't wait to get to Durango. I've only heard awesome things about it. Um, it's a little pricey there, just in case anybody's looking for hotel rooms there. And uh, but we're excited for the opportunity to go get a game in. Okay. Any questions on this past week or this next week? Zach? Yeah. I've always been wanting to ask you this question all year, and it's got nothing to do with last week's game or this week's game. How many plays? Are in your offensive playbook, and then how many of those would may you install for a certain game? Just a rough. Yeah. So I bet you we have we have four core run concepts, but they come out of you know it's it's how you define a play, right? So to us, this is a philosophical question you're asking. So Tom's saying, how many total plays do you have on offense? And um, conceptually, not very many. So your your concepts, maybe you have. Uh, six to eight core pass concepts. You have four to five core run concepts. And then you have um, a menu of what we call specials, right? So sometimes you see us, like we threw a little tight end throwback screen, that's considered a special, or a double pass. You know, some of those wrinkles, and you do one of those every week. Um, and then maybe you have a, a couple other just kind of what you would call core plays. So your, your overall concepts for us isn't very high. But then your differentiation comes with like uh, different motions or formations or personnel groupings that will be on the field. So we have a play called Raven, and Raven is a basic play for us. But we run it out of six different formations, and then off those formations, four different motions, and then uh, some of them have quarterback reads to them, and then some of them don't, all within that one concept. So it's a little bit of a tough question. The overall number of concepts isn't that many, you know, because I, I really believe that it's hard to master a bunch of concepts and be good at it, right? Um, so we try to be a master of those several concepts, and then your differentiation comes with who you choose to give the ball to on that play, um, how you line up, and then how, what kind of defense. You're trying to get the defense to deploy in a certain way and see if you can get them spaced out the way you want them so you can get the, the matchups you want. That's really what we're doing. 
So I just completely didn't answer your question. <laughs> 20. <laughs> no, but that, that's what we're doing. Yep. Can Zach it's a good question. The line? What's that now? Can Zach audible at the line? Does he have that freedom? Can Zach, Zach Jacob? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I should, if I was playing quarterback, we would be so bad right now. <laughs> Um, yeah, can Jake audible at the line is the question. Um, yeah, so the plays are, again, concept-based. Um, much of it now in, in, and this kind of started with, so we're going history now. This kind of started with uh, uh, Brett Favre started to do this back when the, the, so Brett Favre kind of invented this thing they call now the, the RPO, the run pass option. So. Brett Favre wanted to throw the ball, so when they called run plays, you know, uh, uh, Mike Holmgren would call run plays, and he didn't want to run the ball, he would just look over at a receiver and give him one of these, and then he'd stand up and throw it. And if it worked, it was a great job, Brett Favre, and if it didn't, it was a bad play call, right? But that was just Brett Favre doing his own thing. He didn't tell anybody, right? He just threw to, to Taylor. And, uh, and then teams started to catch on that. Well, that makes a little bit of sense, actually. You know, only two guys have to know what's going on, the receiver and the quarterback. And so then that started to develop this run pass option where we actually have a run play so the offensive line is just doing the run play the running back is just doing the run play and then the receivers and the quarterback could be executing a pass play and that's most of what our system is run pass option plays so when you say audible it's really decision making is what it is there are options on the right there are options on the left and there are options in the run game and then the quarterback chooses which option based on film study defensive matchups where the safeties are playing he chooses which which option makes the most sense and then distributes the ball to those options changing completely the plays not really adjusting them by protection two weeks ago playing colorado mines uh we call a pass play it's a bit what it's a it's a it's a what we call a mirrored concept. So there's two receivers on each side, and they're doing the same thing on each side. And it opens up the middle of the field, and Jake saw that the safeties were split. And this is a big play in the fourth quarter of the game against Colorado Mines. And he just turned to Dorian and gave Dorian a, a hand signal and sent Dorian through the middle of the field. And Jake threw it through the middle of the field. And there were about four defenders. He threw it right in between them and landed in Dorian's hands. Well, that was all Jake. He, just, he, he did that on him. But that's within the concepts, but he found that that was the right thing to do in that moment. So those are the type of audibles. Those are good questions, yeah. Are you always changing plays when Jake stops the count and turns to the sideline? Oh, so are we always changing plays when we when Jake uh, looks at the sideline? So there's typically when we're doing that, yeah, we're, we're, we're saying, hey, let's see if we can get him into something, see exactly what it is. Um, so yeah, we're usually we're usually trying to find hey who's the matchup on what player, you know. When we think about it, we're trying to find out like like if I was playing defense against us, you would always throw to whoever I was covering, right? I mean that's pretty simple, okay? You know, Coach Tinker can't cover anybody. Throw it at the guy that he's covering, right? And every defense has um, either. Uh, areas of the field that you can get to based on the way they play defense or individual players that you're trying to go after and usually when we're doing those calls it's to just confirm where those individuals are defensively or those scheme that those areas are defensively that we want to attack it just gives us a, a quick snapshot before we attack that area so, anything else those are great questions should just open up the whole thing for all of you guys' questions. Okay, so again, it's a noon kickoff in Durango. Um, uh, you know, can't wait to take this team on the road. I think we are ready for a road trip uh, of some significance, and then this is certainly going to be that. Uh, and can't wait to see what these guys can do. The opportunity to get back above 500 and get a win on the road in the RMAC, which is what we're trying to do. Okay? All right, rock on. Thank you. Good job. Everybody, please follow the Hard Rocker football program this weekend through GoRockers.com. <clears throat> please come on out to volleyball and soccer at home and here this weekend. <clears throat> I'd like to say thank you again to our friends at Subway for getting the job done. Again, they had run into some logistical issues this morning. And as you saw, they got the food here for us. So thank you to Subway for getting it done. Uh, thank you to Sandy Carlson, Brad William, and Ken Wood for putting all this on, making it happen. And thank you to all of you for your support of the Hard Rockers. We really appreciate it. You can always go on to uh, hardrockclub.org 
to continue your support of the Hard Rock. Please continue to do that. <coughs> next week, uh, next Tuesday, October 31st, we will be at Buffalo Wild Wings at 11.30 a.m. So we will see you then. Thank you so much. <laughs>